Thank you so much. And it's really a delight to be here. Make sure that my screen is sharing. So um, it's so good to be here. I miss the days when I could talk to a group and actually see faces and um, engage uh, with eye contact. But I'm delighted to have the opportunity to share uh, what we're doing in Boston and how uh, we hope it can help people really around the globe. This is a very timely topic um, because now that we are in 2020 with COVID, we're really applying the work that we're doing with artificial intelligence and breast cancer detection and diagnosis um, to a very different time and one where what we're doing is so much even more needed and essential. Our story really started in 2016. I met Regina Barzilay, um, a professor in computer science at MIT. Regina was a world expert in natural language processing and was really surprised in her 40s with no significant risk factors to be diagnosed with breast cancer. As she went through her treatment, she kept thinking, couldn't things be better? Couldn't things be done differently? In her world in computer science, there were so many different ways to take big data to make better decisions. And she felt that that was really lacking in her own personal breast cancer experience. So she and I started a discussion and decided we could change things and do things a little bit differently. We know how important this is. There are more than 3 billion women who are at an age where we really start thinking about their risk of breast cancer. And out of those women, 2 million women are diagnosed every single year, year after year after year. And every year, 600,000 women die around the world. And this isn't a disease of the elderly. Breast cancer strikes young women, uh, women that have uh, young families who are mothers, sisters. Uh, they are um, women that have a lot of uh, life left and the uh, curtailment of life expectancy for breast cancer is really staggering. So one thing that we've known for a long time that has been very elusive is that to be really effective in our prevention and detection strategies, we have to have accurate risk assessment models. It's why we don't screen everyone starting at 20, because there just aren't enough women in their 20s that develop breast cancer to make it worthwhile to screen with mammography women in their 20s, or even in their 30s, unless they have really significant risk factors. So all of the arguments that you'll hear, the, the arguments about should you start at 40 or 50 or 45, it always reminds me that the biggest challenge is that we are so limited to age-based screening. We have 80-year-old women that will never develop breast cancer, and we have 30-year-old women that will develop breast cancer that year. And age is such a poor method to really determine how we screen. Mitch Gale was the father of uh, breast cancer risk assessment models, and he has been studying this, has been working on this, has pointed out to all of us in the field the limitations of current risk strategies. Um, he points out that many of our risk models have been developed on white women, uh, predominantly European Caucasian women, and that we need to do better across the full diversity of women at risk for breast cancer in the world, and also that we just need stronger uh, risk factors to be discovered. Another leader in the field is Jack Cusack, and he was one of the uh, first people that started to think, what if you leveraged the power of the mammogram? What if you took that um, assessment of a woman's mammographic breast density, and what if you added that in to the risk models that we have? Maybe that could help us do better. When we assess risk models, we use something called an area under the curve. A 0.5 is a flip of the coin, half right the time, wrong half the time. An AUC of 0.65 is better than chance. It's not a really robust risk tool, but it's, it, it's doing a, a decent job. And what Jack Husek found was when he added mammographic breast density to his uh, seventh version of his model, in his eighth version, he actually increased uh, the performance. So that was pretty exciting. But we wondered, how strange is it 
that when there is so much complexity to every individual woman's mammogram, when every mammogram is like that woman's thumbprint, I can sit reading screening mammograms and know which mammograms belong to the same woman and which mammograms are from a different woman. And yet we do these crude categorizations of this woman is either dense or she's not dense. We really thought we could do better. We thought we could use a deep learning model to extract the full spectrum of all of those signals embedded in the individual woman's digital mammogram. We're leaving so much data on the image and we wanted with the tools and the power of artificial intelligence to pull those signals out to predict what would happen to this woman in the future. And it certainly took some time. Uh, we amassed large numbers of digital mammograms and we had different methods we used in deep learning, passing each image through an image encoder um, that combined information across the four basic views of a screening mammogram into something called an image aggregator. We actually, in our most recent version, used a different process. Rather than think we would take an image and then add to that image a woman's report of her history, whether or not she had had prior biopsies, what the pathology from those biopsies was, how many times she had been pregnant, did she breastfeed, how many family members had breast cancer. Rather than do that, we would actually teach our model to learn the woman's risk factors based on the mammogram almost like a reverse engineering. So when we could predict the risk factors from the mammogram, we could then go back, combine both the original mammogram and those risk factors we predicted into a cumulative hazard layer. And it turned out that this model allowed us, just based on the mammogram alone, to most precisely predict a woman's future risk of breast cancer without the need for nurse navigators, complex uh, forms to fill out, or even in those domains where women would say, I really feel at a loss because I was adopted, so I can't give you my family history. Or women that we know haven't had access to healthcare, so the fact that they haven't had a prior breast biopsy is just because they actually haven't been engaged. And also, all the human errors that we know happens when we try to record human reports of um, prior biopsies, histories in their family, et cetera. So we had over uh, 240,000 mammograms and over 80,000 patients, and we use some uh, advanced approaches in first having our training set and then our held out testing set, and then a held out set that we validated the model just to see how well it could perform. Like all areas of deep learning and artificial intelligence, we see continued evolution of models. It is a very exciting field to work in. The more quality data you're able to provide the models, the better they become. Remember back in the days when it was like a computer could never beat someone playing chess, but the more opportunities the computer had to play chess or to play Go, the better it became. And we're seeing the same thing with our models. So looking at this graph from left to right, the uh, first bar on the far left is the tire acoustic version 7. In our patient population of these you know, very large data set, it was just about chance. It didn't perform particularly well in discriminating those women who would have a future um, event of breast cancer from those that wouldn't. When we added the breast density into the Tyracusic version seven to Tyracusic version eight, it certainly did, it had quite a leap. It went up to 0.61. What we found was that um, our model though, got significantly better. So the far right, the area under the curve of 0.71, our deep learning version two, is that model that both predicted a woman's risk factors as well as took her full mammogram into the risk prediction. So just on the image alone, we could predict her future risk. And to date, that's our most current model and the one, the one that we're using in our clinic. What was most exciting to us that this image only model performs better than traditional models and it supports equity across races. If you look at the orange bars, that's the tire acoustic version eight, the most advanced commercial model that's available. In white women, it performs with an AUC of 0.64, but in Asian women, it's just barely over chance 0.54. And in our most recent evaluation in African-American and self-identified black women, it was 0.62. But our model, our image only version two model, is stays consistently above 0.7, regardless whether the woman is white, Asian, black, and most recently, 
our latest uh, results were in Hispanic women. So part of our uh, process and our program is as we discover, we bring the, the bench back to the bedside. We bring our research and science and put it back into clinical practice. So every mammogram that's obtained is run through the model and those values, those risk values are made available within the medical record. And this gave us a real opportunity. We knew that we were going to start implementing and informing our patients of these risk factors the more we studied it and the more we understood the accuracy of it. But we didn't understand how critical it was going to be this spring, um, March of 2020 in Massachusetts for the first time in our history, screening mammography was put on hold as the healthcare system shifted resources that were needed for the COVID-19 surge. This was not only happening in the state of Massachusetts, but all across the country. Elective procedures, including screening mammography, screening for colon cancer, um, many immunizations were really halted as resources were directed to the COVID-19 surge. Many of us knew that while this was absolutely critical and essential that this was done, we were extremely concerned about risk, risk of missing early detection um, from cancer. Ned Sharpless um, gave conservative estimates modeling cumulative excess deaths in the US alone, both from colorectal and breast cancers between 2020 and 2030. He knew that annual mammography tests during lockdown were postponed or canceled, and we saw between, depending on the studies we look at, between 89 and 94 percent drops in mammography imaging volumes. It was really staggering. And that providers are dealing with substantial growing backlogs because we have 100,000 screens added every day in the U.S. alone, and there's been significant parts of the country where this has just stopped. So what will be the impact? If we're not able to intervene and find those women at risk for breast cancer and ensure that we are targeting our scarce resources to those women, we know that we will have increased breast cancer deaths. Very conservative estimates are an additional 5,000 breast cancer deaths in the US alone based on COVID. So late May, 2020, Governor Baker asked that we reopen and do this in a safe way with social distancing, hand washing, wearing masks. To prepare for the reopening of the screening mammography, he also urged, along with Ann Klebanski, the head of our Mass General Brigham um, Enterprise in Massachusetts, let's work as a true system, let's expand our impact, let's get more breakthrough ideas out into the world. This graph shows what happened when we shut down screening mammography. The red line shows what we normally do. Uh, just about a thousand mammograms a week in our um, program at Mass General. The blue line shows what happened when the governor and Aunt Klebanski said we need to stop screening. And we did. We shut down screening and we had a long period of time where essentially no women were coming in to screen, canceling over 15,000 women and their exams. When we reopened, we were able to recover. And while we are back at the volumes that we had before the COVID shutdown, this large trough of women who we have not brought back concerns us. We're starting to bring them back in, but we know that as we're bringing those in, until we see that entire trough flip above our normal volumes we were seeing pre-COVID, we actually haven't caught up. And we continue to see many barriers for women to come back in during COVID. Overall, we still have reduced volumes of patients being screened. We've seen shifts in more white women and significantly reduced screening of women of color. And we have a higher percentage of women being screened who are at risk by traditional models. So we thought, let's take the AI risk model scores that we have, and let's also make sure that those women are being invited back in. We have our traditional risk scores. Those women were being invited back. Women with a personal history were coming back in, but we thought we could do more. And this is what we're finding. We're finding that our AI risk score is going to bring in the most women with cancer during times of scarce resources. So when we look at this graph, if we were only able to invite 60% back to screen, we would find over 90% of the cancers if we um, leveraged our AI model to invite those back in labeled as an increased risk first. In the absence of these AI models, the five-year risk models, either the NCI Gale model or the uh, Tyre Cusick five-year model, 
in addition to women with a personal history is the second best approach to take. But we know that we're at a point with such scarce resources and limited access, we need to really um, put at the top of the list those patients at highest risk. Because we do know the impact on patients with significantly reduced access to screening, we will see advanced cancers diagnosed. A recent study looked at April 2020 compared to April 2019 and found that only half the number of cancers were diagnosed across the country. We know that those cancers are still there. We just haven't found them. We haven't diagnosed them. And we have this backlog. So we're working very hard to leverage this technology to bring women back in during these times of scarce resources. I can't stress enough the importance of knowledge of effective strategies for clinical implementation. We've all seen so many times in medical history where fantastic technology was developed, but it didn't pass that test from bench to bedside. It didn't make it out of the research domain and out into clinical practice. So we're really working hard to make sure that our models in AI are being implemented and used by real world radiologists and real world breast surgeons um, to influence um, and improve the outcomes of our patients. There's also a cautionary note for the whole domain of CAD, and this is where I wanna shift our attention a little bit. CAD, computer data detection, isn't really new in breast imaging. We've had CAD products around for a very, very long time. But what we did find, and we learned a lot from this, was that they always didn't have the impact that we hoped that they would have in clinical practice. So this was a study that we did some time ago. We looked at CAD technology that had been used between 2003 and 2009. This was modern digital mammography. Um, we did a lot of study methodology to ensure we were giving CAD the best chance possible of showing its added benefit to patients. But what we found was it just didn't change practice. It didn't improve mammography performance. And that was really discouraging because many of the studies that had been done in more of a reader study setting or not a real world clinical setting showed a lot of promise to the CAD technology, but it just didn't translate over. So we're paying a lot of attention to that. We're having a much shorter bridge from our development of AI models into that clinical evaluation and testing. And this is just the study we published in the Journal of American uh, Medical Association, which showed that radiologists that were reading without CAD had a sensitivity of 87%, meaning they found 87% of all the cancers. And when they were reading with CAD, it was 85%. This wasn't different. And the specificity, how good they were at recognizing a normal mammogram as normal, also didn't change at all. So now I'm gonna shift a little bit to talk about a different domain. What we've talked about to date and so far is predicting a woman's future risk so we can determine how that woman should manage her own healthcare strategy. Should she have a mammogram every year, even with all the challenges of COVID and the risks of, um, that are inherent to COVID, is it really imperative that she continue to get that regular screening? Is she someone that would benefit from screening ultrasound or screening MRI? Should he, she have a discussion with her doctor about genetic testing? That's the entire domain of predicting a woman's future risk. But we're also looking at computer assistance for interpreting the mammogram at hand, the current mammogram. I just showed some data on how it was a bit disappointing, the past of traditional CAD, when marks are made on a mammogram and a radiologist then reviews the marks. We are now moving into a domain of artificial intelligence supported triage. Separating out from radiologists, mammograms that are highly likely to have cancer from those that are highly unlikely to have cancer. Now, we're not anywhere close to a fully autonomous interpretation of mammograms, but triaging high-risk mammograms from low-risk mammograms is a step forward on this roadmap. And we're excited about what we found so far. I always remind people, don't forget to compare what we can do when we leverage the strength of AI to what we are doing around the world with mammography now. Sometimes people will say, well, wouldn't it be terrible if there was a mammogram and there was a cancer that a human might have noticed, but the computer missed? Well, that would be a terrible thing. And yet 
in some ways we seem to be complacent when we have a human radiologist that misses a cancer that six other radiologists would have noticed and seen. So we're also looking for computers to help us reduce what is very well documented known human variation. So this just shows um, what is considered to be acceptable by all um, re recommendations by uh, different organizing committees and healthcare professionals. So we look at sensitivity. They want to make sure radiologists have at least a 75% sensitivity and 88% specificity. And the 100 just means, and if everything was red and we had these averages, mammography would be doing pretty well. Now what we've seen with improved technology and really intensive training in CME of subspecialized uh, breast imagers, that people continue to do better. And that's really exciting. From 1996, um, we were exceeding um, these recommendations. 2004, this is even further improved across the country. And the most recent studies that we've published on from 2007 to 2013 show sensitivities of 87% on average and specificity of 89%. Our AI triage model, where we would only be reading um, about 57% of the exams, is able to meet these metrics. In fact, to improve upon the specificity, which leads to reduced false positives. So this is a domain we're really, really interested in and excited about. And it's important because frankly, most of the world just doesn't have access to x-rays. And the reason why is we don't have enough humans to read the x-rays that we have. This um, Atlantic article, one hospital in Boston has 126 radiologists, Liberia has two. I wanna point out that hospital they mention is my hospital, Mass General. And uh, we need to do better. We need to find ways to provide access globally to this life-saving technology of mammography. But we can't do it if we remain limited to highly subspecialized breast imagers in order to deliver on the promise of mammography. And we know we have errors in radiology, even the best practices. We have physician burnout and depression, and we have the costs associated with screening mammography. In fact, there's no one performance or one method that we see of uh, screening mammography, but a wide range based on the human that happens to be interpreting that exam. The costs are extraordinary and we're looking to reduce that as well. But I think one of the biggest barriers in closing and wrapping up that we have in AI is the risks associated with fear. Really whether it's self-driving cars or um, someone managing or a computer helping manage your bank account, or certainly the domain of healthcare. There are many areas where fear is overshadowing the promise and the potential. I'm a big fan of Jeffrey Hinton. Um, in 2016, he had a uh, quote that got a lot of press. I think if you work as a radiologist, you are like Wiley E. Coyote in the cartoon. You're already over the edge of the cliff. You haven't looked down. There's no ground underneath. It's just completely obvious that in five years, deep learning is going to do better than radiologists. It might be 10. Well, it's 2020. Um, we're one year away from um, being out of, out of work. Maybe it'll be 10. But what I know, and what I know that Professor Hinton knows, is that there's no question that AI can make us better radiologists. My personal opinion is we're going to need more radiologists to manage the increased impact that AI can have in our field, our jobs will be very, very different if we're brave enough to embrace the promise of AI. And I know that I have some colleagues that go way back, this was a paper published in 1964, that would really welcome Professor Hinton's applications and spirit um, into their uh, world. Um, John Wolfe uh, published in 1964, the tedious task of examining 250 women to detect one cancer seems relatively unrewarding unless it is realized that the cancer found is most likely to be in a curable stage. If left until it is clinically evident, the likelihood of salvage diminishes rapidly. So here we are in 2020, not much has changed except the promise of AI to take this tedious task that is not well suited to humans and bring in the power of AI. And that's really what Hinton said. Earlier, an accurate diagnosis is not a trivial problem. We can do better. Why not let machines help us? I'm so privileged to be working here in Boston with experts from MIT, from Mass General. My colleague, Professor Regina Barzile, is, um, is an amazing woman. 
with vision and um, passion to make the world a better place with her time and her talent. And that's what we need, these multidisciplinary approaches to le leverage our strengths from the domains of healthcare, computer science, and regulatory bodies to really create a new future um, for all of us. So thanks so much, and I look forward to any uh, questions. Wonderful, thank you so much, Connie. So yeah, attendees, please uh, enter your questions in the um, session Q&A, and we'll do our best to get to them. Uh, I had a question. Why was the CAD not effective? Did, did scientists figure out what the... Yep. You know, that's such a great question. Here's what I think. I think traditional CAD was still absolutely dependent on humans because it just flagged lesions, flagged spots on the mammogram. And then the human had to look at every one of those flags and make a decision about it. And I think it wasn't really leveraging the power of the computer because it's still that final trap was the human. So we found there were some humans that would use CAD and do really well with it. And others, it was terrible because the CAD wasn't precise enough to just mark cancers. It marked cancers and a whole lot of other things. The early CAD products, for example, would make you know four to eight marks on every mammogram. So rather than looking at 100 mammograms, I'm looking at 800 marks. And, uh, and that was just really hard for, for radiologists to, to learn how to, how to use that. You know, is it possible we could go back and, and bring back some of that CAD technology and train humans to use it better? We could, but to me, that's just delaying the obvious. We can't be dependent on highly specialized humans to really leverage the strength of screening mammography. Absolutely. Well, how do we get these models and tools out to scale? And if you can start with, like, how are you using it at Mass General? And is that different than what other hospital systems are doing today? Well, in many ways, it, it definitely feels like the Wild West. You know, you can just uh, put, you know, AI and mammography or AI and cancer detection and, and you get overwhelmed. And, um, and in many ways, that's good. That's the enthusiasm, the excitement, the people knowing there's something real here and, and we want to tackle and address this. But gosh, for the consumer, for the woman trying to sort out what's real and what's not, it can be really, really challenging. Um, we're still in early phases at, at Mass General. We, we are evaluating our, our mammograms. We're doing a lot of clinical research and studies to, to assess how strong um, uh, predictors these are. And we're having those early conversations with patients to explain to them, you know, this is what we know. Um, and it's, it's not a perfect predictor. It, it's better than anything else that we've tested and evaluated. And here's how we use it. And so, um, so we're, we're hoping that we're going to move forward pretty quickly. We, we, we think we have ways to do that. Um, I think a year from now, things will be quite, quite different. Um, but we're, we're still early. So when people will call or email and say, ah, can I have my mammogram assessed? I, I wish we were at the point where we could just go to scale and we're, we're just not quite there yet. And is it the kind of scenario where different research institutions are all trying this on their own? And is there a way to share between those institutions? If, if one particular institution comes up with a model that's incredibly effective, can you get it out to the broader population? We, we really want to, and we actually think that the, um, the culture and the community of computer scientists and AI in general is very open to that. You see this concept of forming these federations, forming these communities that are not only forming federations so that they can have better models and they can learn from each other's models, but also federations so they can disseminate the knowledge out more rapidly and more quickly. So I, I, we're already seeing that, and we are going to see more of that. Um, and it's a, it's, it, that's, a, that's an exciting aspect of all of this. And I do wonder if, yeah, I mean, computers, you know, the whole notion of open source, I think it is a really open community. So maybe there will be quicker progress because it's, you know, involving AI. Yeah, we're very excited about that. And certainly, and it's just part of the academic community with each um, model that we test and evaluate and publish on, we release um, the code at the time of the publication. And that's been very standard for our MIT MGH collaboration. And we're, we're excited for other people to learn from it and to, to be able to leverage how far we've gotten and, and take it even further. 
uh, we had a question about what software or tool stack are you using in the image analysis? We've used um, several different programs. Some of them have actually been um, fairly straightforward. We started out with some basic ResNet and then used um, other uh, methods um, out of that. And there's a, um, a web link um, that Adam Yala at MIT has set up where people can go on and really the, the details of all the different methods that we use in developing our models um, are, are there and available on the internet. Super cool. If you um, can get that to us, we'll make sure to post it so people Perfect. can. Perfect, yep. Uh, and then let's see a question from Charles. How do you gather and merge non-clinical data like social determinants of health uh, with the clinical record and how is, or, or do you, and how is the data presented to health providers so that they can use that info to improve health outcomes? That is such a huge and fantastically important question. So I'm really appreciative that you asked. Um, we are um, wanting to be more nimble and faster at this whole area and domain of geocoding. So when we, we're basically scratching the surface. I mean, I'm a, I'm a physician, I'm a radiologist, I'm a breast imager, I do not know the advanced ways of doing this. We literally were going online and reading about the whole geocoding. We have in our, um, we have a very large repository from 2014 to 2020 of hundreds of thousands of women. And um, the, the information is, is de-identified, but we do have some factors such as zip code and their outcomes and all of that. So we went in and saw by using zip code, we could do some geocoding and start mapping to the different, um, uh, all of these different variables that are available as far as in that zip code, the average um, percent that have a high school education, college education, their income level, um, how many people live in, in their homes. And so this was sort of uh, blowing my mind and how much data was actually out there. But I know there are experts in this area that could really rapidly move this forward. I, I hope that the question is really sort of asking Gosh, is there a way that we could have that culture and that community that we could actually identify and implement faster? And so I'm gonna give a really grassroots from a, a physician's perspective um, story. When we reopened, we found that um, we didn't reopen in an equitable way. And what mm -hmm. happened was um, first we saw a drop in our women of color being screened the one set the, of the six screening centers I have, the one center that was in a predominantly Hispanic neighborhood was the one that opened latest, didn't have evening hours and didn't have the Saturdays open. That It was about resources and different things, but it really pained me when we talk about institutionalized racism. It, it's, it's not bad people, it's actually institutions that aren't nimbly working enough to, to make these changes. We saw more people going out to our community health centers in the more affluent neighborhoods. So to be able to just shift that, honestly, from my perspective, is if we can really drive home how, how, how dramatic the data are, and then say, therefore, this must happen. I think, I think that's what we need to do. But um, from my perspective, the academic medical centers, they really respond to data, um, to, to carefully collected, curated data. And so that's what we're working really hard on in, in, the, in the best ways we can. We know from just our basic, this big database that we have, we know that we um, completely shifted to our uh, wealthier uh, community practices. And we know that we increased the, the white women that were being screened and we decreased the women of color that were being screened. We're now trying to do some of this geocoding to look at that also tracked as we assume it does with socioeconomic status, educational levels. Um, you know, some of our critical workers that just quite simply can't, can't be away from work during the day or, or um, Monday through Friday. So we're, we're really trying to address that. Or they don't have childcare and they have children at home who are e-learning. So Exactly. This is a great question. And I know you and I have talked about this. The, would AI bring down the cost of, of having a mammogram? And I will just say this literally this week, I opened up a bill for an MRI because I'm in the high risk population. I get an MRI once a year and it's $2,000 with, with insurance. Um, so that's the thing that excites me so much about what you all are doing is, is being able to be less reliant upon these invasive procedures and really expensive procedures. Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm loving these questions. And so um, uh, our um, mission 
is to increase access to high quality care to the full diversity of women at risk at affordable cost. And when we look at each part, each phrase within that mission, um, there is so much that AI can do to deliver on that. And a very concrete example, we know that lung cancer screening with CT saves lives, but very, very, very few people undergo CT lung cancer screening. Interestingly, in that when you go back to those original studies, chest x-rays weren't terrible. They weren't as good as CT, but they weren't terrible. But we never tried AI with the chest x-ray. What if AI plus chest x-ray can be as good as CT with a human? What if a, a mammogram with AI can be good as an MRI? We're also um, carefully studying contrast-enhanced mammography rather than contrast-enhanced MRI, which would be a fraction of the cost, and you wouldn't have to go on the magnet, which a lot of women would, would love not having to do that um, yeah. as well. So there's a lot that we're looking at costs. Uh, absolutely, the cost would need to come down. We're very concerned. You know, the only test that women can really feel comfortable with is the screening mammograms, and there's some threat for those uh, being taken away, that the screening mammogram is part of a, a right that a woman has. Um, and Yet, if a woman has an abnormal screening mammogram, all the downstream costs are not covered. So she really puts herself at risk by getting that free mammogram. If she needs, if she's recalled, if she has a biopsy, if she needs a, a surgery, then that, that is a, a very, very different area. And um, the cost of a breast MRI pretty much is gonna put, you know, everyone, um, it's, it, it's, it is not affordable or sustainable for the vast majority of women um, around the globe and, and in the U.S. So that's so. Then I think the next question is: When do you think this will actually hit? You know, the the masses. If we're looking at, you know, you all are doing testing now, and we're in the early phases. This is two years out or five years out before it's impacting, you know, the average woman. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm a little bit like Professor Hinton. I, I, I'm very enthusiastic about how quickly we can make things happen. So when he said, five years, radiologists are going to be obsolete. Um, and then he sort of re retracted on that. But I'd really like to say two years. I'd really like to think in two years that it is just commonplace for imaging centers to have AI fully integrated into their practice. And it's just commonplace in the specific domain of screening mammography that women expect to be told more precisely do I need a mammogram every year? Should I have another test? Tell me what I should do based on my individual risk profile. I, I really think that's, that's right in our grasp, and I think that that's the first domain we're gonna go into. I think that the other track that we're working very hard on for improved image interpretation, um, that's gonna be a process that people keep iterating on in that, that roadmap that we have. At the first level, just triaging, like these are more difficult cases, these are simpler cases. I think that'll help a lot of practices where they have a small cluster of highly specialized, enthusiastic breast imagers, and then other general radiologists that, that need to read the mammograms, but frankly, they prefer not to. So we can help with that. We can help direct the specialized attention to the most challenging cases and the others to the, to the ones that have been filtered by the AI model. That's such a good, um it makes me think of one of our other keynotes next week. Um, we have a keynote um, from Disney and they talk about uh, in animation that the algorithms now are so advanced that, so for example, the ocean in Moana, the algorithms built the ocean and got it 80% of the way there so that the humans, the artists could focus on that final 20% and do what a machine can't do. And you know, you take all those years of knowledge and expertise, and you apply it to the most important cases—the twenty percent and not the eighty percent. That that is exactly it. I'm gonna, if you don't mind, I'm gonna use that analogy because it's a perfect one. You know, and also think about how those artists, how their satisfaction is just gonna go up. How could it not? Like they're doing the thing that is, you know, feeds their soul. The the routine mundane, you know, for myself going through a thousand screening mammograms, trying to find five or six cancers when the vast majority are normal, normal, normal. But the days that I spend and the time I spent talking to a patient about, we found something, here's what we're going to do next, or we need to do a biopsy, but it's going to be okay. And now we need to get the pathology back. And then we can talk about that. That, that whole domain is, is what feeds us. And the reason why we went to medicine, um, it, it wasn't to be a, a computer just trying to sort through digital images looking for signals that a computer is going to be better than we are anyway at finding. Yeah. 
Well, this leads to, I think this will be our last question because we're almost at time, but it's, I think it's a perfect one. How will training change for radiologists and what do you tell you know, folks who are in med school now or who are graduating and thinking they wanna go into radiology, what's it gonna look like for them five, 10 years from now? It is gonna be the most exciting domain in healthcare. So the first thing I do is don't be afraid. I have lots of people saying, I was gonna go into radiology, but you know, I, I don't think radiology is gonna be a field in the future. And I tell them, how exciting is that to have this once in a lifetime opportunity to go into the field that is gonna be so different as you enter it and as you grow with it, that people won't even recognize it, that you'll be able to be part of that change and say, you won't believe what it was like when I started my training. Look at what it is now. That, that impact, that power is gonna be extraordinary. I can't imagine a more exciting domain to be in. So mainly it's don't fear this, embrace it. It's so exciting. And if you have a creative, open, bright mind and you like to be part of having a high impact and seeing things change and get better and not just doing the same thing again and again and again and again for decades, um, radiology is your field. It's, um, it's amazing what we'll accomplish. And um, I can't imagine a better time to go into it. I wish I could wiggle my nose and be 30 years younger and start all over again, because this is the time. Um, to go into radiology. We, we need bright minds and, and we've got a lot of work to do. Well, you are clearly at the tip of the spear here. So uh, I, I am sure there will be many following in your footsteps with this inspiration. So it is five o'clock. I can't thank you enough. This is, it's so rewarding to hear what you're doing in the field. And uh, we're all just really lucky to have shared this time with you. Thank you so much. Cindy, thank you so much. And everyone stay healthy and well. And I hope at some point we see each other at conferences in person. So thank you. Exactly. And uh, the attendees, we will see you next week. Uh, as I mentioned, we've got Marlon West, the head of effects animation for Disney. Uh, he is a St. Louis native for those of you in St. Louis hometowner and um, phenomenal sessions from uh, speakers from Facebook, uh, Square, uh, just an incredible roster. So look it up online, join us next week and uh, have a good week in between. Thanks again. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.